So let's talk kind of briefly about the journey of rebar from factory to our job site. And the way we get it is in 20 foot lengths, but it starts out as a giant spool of rebar. It, there's a huge coil of rebar, and then that gets shipped to another factory that straightens the coil of rebar out and then chops it off at 20 foot lengths. Okay. That's what we get it in. That's how we like to work with it. It's pretty heavy. Anything longer than 20 feet would be awkward to carry around, maneuver around a job site. And then the other thing, it'd be just difficult to transport it. Okay. So everything's going to come in 20 foot lengths. And then this is the, the key to rebar installation. It has to run continuously through the footings and the slabs. Okay. We have to pretend we're not pretending, but we have to manipulate the rebar in such a way that it turns into one gigantic piece of rebar all the way around our footing. Okay. Even though it's only 20 foot lengths. Okay. So, so the way we accomplish that is by splicing the rebar together with tie wire. Okay. If we need to make up a 40 foot run of rebar, we don't just butt two pieces of rebar together. Okay. That's considered two separate pieces of rebar and it's not running continuously throughout the footings or the slabs. We're going to take two pieces of rebar, overlap them and tie them in two places with tie wire. And that turns it into one stick in the eyes of the law. Okay. There is a specific formula for determining that rebar overlap. Okay. And it is 40 times the diameter of the bar. So we're typically working with half inch rebar, number four rebar, 40 times the diameter. If we're working with half inch bar, 40 times half is 20 inches. So in order to make two pieces into one piece, we need to overlap these pieces 20 inches. So from this point to this point is 20 inches. That being said, rebar is kind of rough work. We're not pulling out our tape measures and making it exactly 20 inches. It can be longer. Okay. We're not going to cut a little bit off the end of a stick to ensure that there's 20 and exactly 20 inches of rebar. We're just going to overlap it more. Okay. When I'm running number four bar in a slab or a footing, I tend to overlap everything 24 inches because 24 inches is two feet and that's very easy math for me to just whatever I need I need to splice these two bars together add two feet to that number okay An another way kind of a shortcut for determining that splice formula because it's easy with half inch right 40 times half is 20 but it gets a little um more difficult when we're trying to figure out like 40 times 5 eighths. Okay, that's a little bit harder math for me. Or 40 times 3 eighths, 120 eighths, and then you have to reduce it down. Okay. Remember, we're going to describe rebar by a single digit number four bar, number five bar, number three bar. Okay. If you multiply that number by five, that will also give you the splice formula. So if we're working with number four bar, I'm going to multiply number four bar by five, and that's going to give me 20 inches of overlap. If I'm working with number five bar, I'm going to multiply that by five, and that's going to give me 25 inches of overlap. Again, one more example, number three bar. If we multiply number three bar by five, that's going to give us 15 inches of overlap. Okay. In residential construction, we're not going to vary too much from three, four, or five bar. Those are the most common sizes of rebar that we're going to encounter. And that also, good luck trying to find anything smaller or larger than that at any of the lumber yards around here. That If you needed something bigger than that, that would probably be a special order item. Okay. So, when we're building a or putting rebar in a footing, we're going to have to make bends around the corner. 
Okay, remember this rebar has to run continuously around. Okay, and so there's a special tool that we have that most people use to bend the rebar, and you can bend all sorts of different angles on it to turn corners. Okay, and it also cuts rebar. So we're gonna watch a little video and see how that thing works. The Nadura Rebar Bender and Cutter provides access to a portable and efficient method of cutting and bending rebar for placement into the Nadura wall system. The unit comes with two cutting heads that will cut and bend up to number 5 or 15M diameter bar. So that's the video. But our rebar bender cutter that we have is slightly different. It has a hole that you slide the rebar in to cut it to length, and you pull down on that bar, and it actually does shear the rebar off. Okay, and then it's a similar setup with the rollers, and you slip the rebar in the other direction and pull down on the handle, and it'll bend the end of that rebar up and make a 90 degree angle out of it. So let's talk about anchor bolts. Let's get a little more in depth with anchor bolts. And these are going to be really critical for our foundation. Remember, we talked briefly about these, and what the anchor bolts do is they are cast into the concrete and then we're actually going to use those anchor bolts to bolt our walls down to the foundation okay that's one of those mechanical connections that creates that structural diaphragm that continuous load path for our house okay without those anchor bolts we're just relying on nails to hold that house to the foundation okay and it wouldn't be too far-fetched to imagine an earthquake knocking all of those houses off of their foundations. And that, that happened in 92 in Ferndale. Just the nature of that earthquake was kind of a sliding jolt and there was lots and lots of houses that just slid right off their quote unquote foundations. Okay, again, those were just post and pier foundations. They weren't necessarily concrete perimeter foundations, but bolting the house down to the concrete adds a tremendous amount of resistance to those loads that can occur okay so just to be very specific the anchor bolts are going to bolt the mud sill down to the foundation and the mud sill generally is a two by six piece of pressure treated lumber we want it to be pressure treated because it's going to be in contact with the concrete which could theoretically be wet it could be wicking moisture okay remember Concrete is not an impermeable surface, okay? It's going, water can pass through it. It can move water up through concrete and into this mud sill, okay? So we want this to be resistant to moisture, okay? So these anchor bolts are going to be spaced according to the plans. The most generic spacing is every 72 inches. So every six feet, we're gonna have an anchor bolt, okay? We'll get more into this about the spacing here in a minute, but what the code calls for is that we have to have seven inches of embedment minimum into the concrete, okay? Most of the time what we're doing is we're buying 10 inch anchor bolts. Okay, 5 eighths by 10 anchor bolts. Some people call these J bolts also. And we want to have these placed before we pour. Okay? The inspector really wants to see that we have all of our anchor bolts in place. And we don't want to be running around while we're trying to pour concrete, setting these anchor bolts in place. Um, I've done that in the past. When I first started out, that's the way we did them. Okay, we'd be pouring concrete and then someone would go along and be measuring out anchor bolts and setting them in place. And invariably what happened, a couple things happened, uh, about three quarters of the way through the concrete started getting too hard 
And so we're hammering anchor bolts into the concrete with a sledgehammer, okay? And all that's doing is just plowing through the concrete and leaving a big void there. So it's probably not holding the anchor bolt at all anyway, okay? The other thing that would happen is in the midst of all this panic, we would be making mistakes about where the anchor bolts were supposed to be placed. And then we would have anchor bolts in the wrong place. Okay, so a couple things, a couple different scenarios for anchor bolts. If our foundation is going to be a crawl space or a perimeter foundation, we're laying out the anchor bolts to avoid where the floor joists are going to go. Okay, the floor joists are going to sit directly on top of this mud sill if we're doing a crawl space foundation. Okay, so again, we need to avoid where those floor joists are going to go. We, we want the floor joists to be every 16 inches on center so we can put a piece of plywood down on top of them. We don't want to be moving the floor joists around to accommodate the anchor bolt placement. Okay, We want to lay out all of our floor joists first, place the anchor bolts accordingly, and then we won't have any problems. Okay, We're going to hold them in place with this Simpson bracket called an anchor mate. It's a plastic clip that nails to the form board and it holds the anchor bolt up in place and it holds it off the form board so that it's exactly centered in the mud sill. Okay. All right. Let me back up a little bit here. We talked about how if we're pouring a crawl space foundation, we need to lay out these anchor bolts so that they miss the floor joists. If we're gonna do a slab foundation, remember we're not gonna have floor joists, the slab is the floor, but our walls are going to attach directly to that slab. So we need to lay out all of our studs so that our studs miss these anchor bolts, okay? Same thing, we don't wanna lay out the anchor, or just place the anchor bolts willy-nilly and then have to work around that later. Notching studs, moving studs out of the way, that turns into a nightmare. We want our studs to be every 16 inches on center so we can take a piece of plywood and put it on the wall and not have to worry about anything else, okay? So that's one super critical thing we're gonna do before we pour, okay? We wanna allow time to lay out all of these anchor bolts, make sure we have an appropriate number of anchor bolts, okay? The inspector's gonna to wanna to look at that and see that we have everything in place, okay? This is a picture of a Titan bolt made by our friends at Simpson Strong Tie. And what a Titan bolt does is it can replace, like one for one, it can replace an anchor bolt, okay? You can come back after the fact and add these Titans in, okay? Some people are saying, why don't we just do that? Forget about trying to lay everything out and figure it all out. Why don't we just build all the walls, build the floor, and then come back and put Titans in later? Okay, well, one thing is this costs $10. This costs $1. So there's significant material differences, okay? The other thing is, okay, maybe we're gonna spend an hour and a half, two hours, laying everything out and making sure we have anchor bolts right where we need them. We're going to spend way more than that drilling out all of these Titans and placing them. Okay. We're going to have to use a roto hammer and drill into the concrete and clean the hole out and ratchet these bolts down. It's no picnic putting these things in. They certainly have their place though. Okay. And sometimes if we're pouring a slab and there's like an intermediate bearing wall down the middle of the slab, I won't try and place anchor bolts down that intermediate wall, okay? It's gonna be hard to hold them in place. And then the other thing, it's gonna be hard to trowel around them when we're pouring concrete. So I'll just come back and put Titans in later. That's fine, I don't have a problem with that. But most of the time, it's much easier for us to just have these in place before we pour, okay?